Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Peter. I am the last site assistant standing up at the Hope Park Museum. I shall bid you a welcome to the Hamilton Mausoleum. Now, along with the two buildings that make up our museum, that Portland House, the big sandstone house that sits on Rio Street itself, and Duke Alexander's Riding School, this is all that's left of the great Hamilton Palace complex of buildings. It is without doubt the most iconic building in Hamilton. I mean, everybody knows the mausoleum. Even if they've got absolutely no idea of what it is, everybody knows about the big dome that sits in the park. That's the great uh, signpost to everybody coming home to Glasgow. or walking down south and they drive past it in the motorway, they fly over it, they see the mausy. Ah, we're nearly home. And it is, of course, the great lasting reminder of our Alexander, 10th Duke of Hamilton, El Magnifico, as he was known to all and sundry. <laughs> Scurrilous rumours do the rounds of delusions of grandeur. <laughs> so, before we go on about the building itself, or the buildings, a wee bit about our boy, about Duke Alexander. So, born 1767, like most young aristocrats of the day, very well read, well educated young man, travelled extensively around Europe. He loved his art, his history, his architecture. Uh, from a very early age, you'd start putting together what would become the most incredible collection of paintings, statues, furniture probably ever assembled in Britain. His father, Archibald, became Ninth Duke in 1799 and basically wanted nothing to do with the estate up here. He was quite happy down in the estate in Lancashire, one of the many estates that they had all over Britain, the family. He was very successfully running his racehorses. So he said to Alexander, see that palace up in Scotland, son? Yes, Dad. Yes, yeah, yours. On you go. Thanks, Dad. Yes. So, he basically came up and became Duke in all but name. And he becomes this fantastic example of an Englishman who comes to Scotland and goes native in a very, very, very big way. So, Lord Lieutenant of Lancashire, he's the MP for Lancashire. In 1806, he's actually off to Russia. He is the British ambassador at the court of the Tsar in St. Petersburg the plum posting of the British Diplomatic Service. At that time, you had to pay your own ways. But you could be recompensed to a percentage for your service to crown and country in silver. And our boy took full advantage of that. In fact, right up to the day he died, there were silversmiths in London still chasing after him, looking for this unpaid bill. <laughs> for his, for his, his knives and his forks, now he's very thorough silverware. He was also, at that time, an unashamed admirer of Napoleon Bonaparte. So you can imagine how well that went down in society at the height of the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, which is why him and the Tsar ended up having a huge big fight. And he was basically told to get out of Russia. Uh, in 1810, that's when they finally got married off to Susan Euphemia Beckford. Hence the reason why there's so many places in Alton with the Beckford name attached to it. Beckford Street, Beckford House, Beckford Lodge, where I come out of the world. <coughs> the Beckfords and Hamilton were probably the two richest families in Britain at that time. Her father, William Beckford, was an old friend of Alexander, another mad eccentric collector. If you want to read how not to build a stately home, uh, read the story of Font Hill Abbey, William uh, Beckford's house. Or how he tried to build it on the cheap, with workers bribed by a drink from nearby Windsor Castle. Three times he tried to build a tower to his place, and three times it fell down on him, sort of thing, you know. Um, his father, Sir William Beckford, Lord Mayor of London, uh, he, the family fortune raised on the slave tobacco trade, but we'll keep that quiet. He actually, inherited, <coughs> excuse me, he actually inherited his father's fortune when he was only 10 years old, and it was worth the equivalent of 10 million pounds in today's money. When William <coughs> Beckford was actually five years old, he went to his dad and he went, Dad, I'd like to learn to play the piano. All right, son, I'll get you a personal tutor. That personal tutor just happened to be the eight-year-old Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. <laughs> Hence then, Beckford would actually go around and he actually claimed it. He actually came up with all the good tunes and Mozart uh, stole them off him. But uh, it must have been in the genes because Susan Beckford herself was a very accomplished concert pianist and cellist who would give performances and recitals in the palace across the way there. Uh, so much so that the highest profile visitor to Hamilton, if you don't count 60 years ago and now uh, nine months ago, ten, uh, six months ago, when the Rolling Stones played the Chanton Hall Hotel and caused a riot, which is when it banned pop music from getting played in any concert venue in Hamilton for about half a dozen years. Uh, eight, 800 tickets sold, 2,000 people turned up with tickets. Guess what happened? <laughs> yes. Uh, 
just fly the knock back a wee promoter in 1969 from the townhouse uh, who was trying to get his young artist a gig in Hamilton. Hence the reason why David Bowie never got a chance to play Hamilton, sort of thing. But uh, the great Friedrich Chopin stayed in the palace on his last tour. They basically killed him, as he said, my Scottish ladies will not leave me alone. <laughs> now, we don't think he actually played the piano in the palace, but we've got enough evidence that he did play the piano in our assembly room in Portland House. So we can claim that we had Mozart playing in our house. Sort of thing. Uh, so you can see the sort of characters we're dealing with here. In 1819, Alexander's father died. Being the eldest son, being the Marquis, this is when he officially becomes 10th Duke of Hamilton. And this is where the story really gets going, as they say. The Duke of Hamilton, ah, here comes the rain, because I'm starting to talk about it. The Duke of Hamilton was and still is the senior peer of all the Scottish Dukes in the earldom. Key keeper not that we don't palace. Uh, the Duke of Hamilton still holds the keys to Holyrood Palace over in Edinburgh. <coughs> he also has very much his royal duties. Um, if the king or queen, whoever is in the throne in London, Whenever they are visiting Scotland, they are under the care, attention, guardianship of the Duke of Hamilton. So if you cast your mind back a couple of years ago when the Queen passed away and she lay in state uh, in Edinburgh, it was the current Duke Alexander, number 16, who laid the Scottish crown on her coffin and his personal bodyguard, the Royal Company of Archers, stood guard over her body. Oh. They're the lads you saw then in the funeral procession down in London, the lads in the green uniforms with the eagle feathers in their cap. That's the Duke of Hamilton's private bodyguard. He is the commanding officer and member of that. And again, when Charlie Boy was up getting the Scottish crown, it was from the current Duke. So if you cast your minds back to our other Duke, our Alexander, number 10, in 1821 you had what was known as the 1 in 20 daft days of Edinburgh. It was the first visit by the ruling monarch, it was King George IV, and it was the first visit of the ruling monarch to Scotland in 200 years. So Walter Scott arranged it. And it was 21 days of dinners, fates, events. And our boy, being the senior peer, thought he'd be there by his king's side all the way through. Aye, not once did the Duke even look his way, let alone uh, speak to him. So his pride was hurt, you can guess. The king never even acknowledged his existence. So after giving a fantastic rambling speech about the rodlerism, and respect that one of the big do's, which went down like a lead balloon with his contemporaries, Alexander went, well, you know what, if that's what he thinks of me, I'm going to show him what it means to the Duke of Hamilton. So he embarked on his great programme, which basically bankrupted the family and sowed the seeds of the old demise of everything. So his palace, his palace would have been where the palace sports grounds are over there. If you're ever in the bowling pavilion of the Hamilton Palace sports grounds, you're basically standing in the front door of the palace. When you walk through the car park, you're making your way through the kitchen court and through the main rooms of the palace. Already with a large, substantial building he had over there. That was Duchess Anne's palace, the second incarnation of the palace that he inherited. Wasn't big enough or good enough for him. So David Hamilton, the great architect of the day, was commissioned, money no object, to rebuild, reface, expand the palace. So ten years later, what you have over there is the largest and grandest non-royal palace in Britain, if not Europe. All 150 rooms of it. One more window than Buckingham Palace. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Other projects. Well, <coughs> uh, the dog kennels. Shatler Row. Not big enough or good enough for him. He gets Dungable House, the big hunting lodge down past on the Muirkirk Road down past Straven. That was his hunting lodge. Uh, when Kaiser Street was created in the 1820s to give Hamilton its brand new continental style European boulevard main street. The bridge between where the townhouse is and the O'Keefe building that spans Cato Lane, that's Duke Alexander's bridge. He put the money up for that. The riding school, I just have a little museum. That's because he admired the Tsar's riding school in St. Petersburg. And he decided when I'm Duke, I need a riding school. There it was, 1837. <coughs> <coughs> Tell I called last week. 1837, open for business. As far as we're aware, <coughs> not a single horse has actually set foot in the place. It's been used for everything but, from wedding receptions to a boxing gym to now a museum. And then, in 1840, 
we start work here on the mausoleum. So, where are the big covered pitches over there? Then? Uh, the five side pitches there. So the big circus tent, the big covered pitch over there. That is where the collegiate church would have stood. The collegiate church was Hamilton's original church, built with permission from the Pope in the 1500s. Then after the Reformation, changed sides, became the local parish church, and remained that way until what we now know as the old parish church of Church Street was the brand new parish church. So when that opened in 1837, the old collegiate church was abandoned and semi-demolished and left a rack in ruin. So a hundred years later, when you get to Alexander's time, for all his plans, for his palace, his buildings, his landscape and his gardens up and down here, he's got a ruined church in his garden. Oh no, I went rid of that. <laughs> More important than that, what was still intact within the church was the burial aisle. That's where the ancestors were residing. That's where El Magnifico was going when he popped his clogs. Ah, no chance, you think I'm going in there? No, he was going to build a proper resting place as befitting the stature of the Douglas Hamiltons. So, it's not just a pure vanity project on his part. Well, it is, but this is him making a statement on behalf of himself and the family of the importance of the Douglas Hamiltons. And he had very set ideas about what he wanted. He wanted a Roman temple, which is why we've got a mini pantheon over here, with a bit of Hadrian's tomb thrown in for good measure. Uh, he actually did his own sketches and gave them out to the architects. Don't know if nepotism was at work, but guess what? This is David Hamilton's design, his cousin. A distant relation. Although he died very early in the project, and a couple of other architects came and went, until David Bryce of Bond and Bryce Architects in Edinburgh, he's the man who comes in and sees the building through to its bitter end. Now, there's a lot in the mausoleum you've got to preface by saying, so... The story goes, because there are so many stories and tales built up about this place over the last 150 years. Every one of them has an element of truth to them. They've just taken on arms and legs as the years have gone on. So, one of them is, we're not quite sure how long it took to build this place. We've got some sources saying it was finished in 1858, some, uh, 56, sorry, some 58. Burn and Bryce architects weren't finally squared up until 1860. So you're looking at about 20 years down here, doing all the work. What we do know, there's grand edifice, there's just two rooms. There is the crypt and there is the chapel. <coughs> and the crypt was ready to take in borders in August of 1852. So with due pomp and ceremony, and he did like his ceremonies, as you'll find out, Duke Alexander saw the mortal remains of his ancestors and the lovely new oak coffins brought across from the collegiate church, relayed to rest within the walls of the crypt. Right lads, that's a good job, well done. Thank you, Grace. Right, I'm off down to London on business. I'll see you when you come back up the road. You can start tearing that thing down officially. Right, sir, that's great. We'll see you when you come up the road. So there he is, a couple of days later, <laughs> propped up in bed in his apartments, 12 Portman Square in London, just along from the BBC, just down the road from the Chinese Embassy as he is now, where the big hotel is, where his apartments were. Sitting up on bed. Goes to the footman. When get me that book down? Yes, sir, Grace. <coughs> hey, your Grace. Oh, your Grace. Your Grace. Yes, heart attack at the grand old age of 85. Very good age for the Victorian era. So they brought his body up from London. He lay in state in the palace across the way there. And on the first Saturday, the first Friday of September, 1852, the 4th of September, three and a half thousand people suitably attired, or as near as their circumstances would allow, as the newspaper reports of the time would say, uh, passed by his body to pay their respects to him. And then the following day, he's laid to rest within his mausoleum. Now, this is Duke Alexander's mausoleum. You think he's slumming it downstairs with the family? Oh, no, no, no. He's got the upstairs all to himself. So, the lay him to rest in his great casket, more of which later. The thing is, the building's not finished. The floor still has to be laid, the dome still has to be finished. So they laid the rest in his casket, then built a temporary brick shroud over the casket to protect it, and then finished the building around them, which must have been great fun for the workmen. Don't drop your hammer on the Duke boys. <laughs> Don't. Right, I'm going to start throwing some numbers at you now. The building stands 120 feet tall. 
The walls at the base of the crypt down here are 15 feet thick. The oh. walls at the base of the chapel are just 5 feet thick. But this is the biggest and best Lego set you have ever seen. Because there is nothing holding this building together. All this sandstone all quarried within a 12 mile radius. The blocks are all keyed into each other. So literally, wow. it's the weight of the building that's actually holding it together. Wow. So without giving too much away, yes, the old girl has moved over the years, but it's been that flexibility into her that's why she's been able to survive the stresses and the strain. If she'd been properly cemented, then she would have probably cracked open like a big Easter egg. But the April Fool joke at the amateur advertiser was trying to play the whole day. So, this is actually the front of the building. People think the other side, the golf course side, the front, that's the back door. This is the front door. And before COVID, I would have said facing east towards Jerusalem. Now, the lockdown in the museum was great fun. Place to ourselves. Now, oh, the amount of research we've got done, really, honestly, I were doing great stuff in here. And one of the things was, myself and Alec now retired and did the tours, is the mausoleum actually facing east? Is it facing towards Jerusalem? Right, well, Google Maps, wonderful invention. <laughs> yes, she is facing east works, but Jerusalem's actually way down that way. So we started drawing lines. What is due east of Hamilton? Well, 1500 miles due east of Hamilton, that way, is Moscow. So when Putin goes to Lally, you know where it's coming from. I've heard some uh, Ukrainian refugees on my tours through the summer, and as soon as I mentioned him, you just see them going, oh, I went, ah, eh, ah, like that, sort of thing, you know. But, you know how you can look at things for years, and then something obvious just pops out at you? Looking on Google Maps, because Google Maps is a line north, south, east, west. The mausoleum is not straight, i.e. she's not pointing due north, south, east, west, she's slightly askew. Oh, there's something going on here. So again, that thing in Google Maps where you can draw lines to measure distances. Right. Started drawing a line between the two lines. Make sure we keep 90 degrees, keep the angle nice and straight. Right, where are we going to end up? And east, north, east, 35 miles later, you end up at the front door of Holyrood Palace. Mm -hmm. Who's got the keys to Holyrood Palace? Mm -hmm. Who's got the apartments of Holyrood mm -hmm. Palace? Duke of Hamilton. Right. Let's try the back door, see where we end up. But another 10 miles you add on to your distance. You end up at Brodick Castle, or the Island of Arran. Whose castle is that? Who owned three quarters of the Island of Arran? Who's at the Arran Estate? The Duke of Hamilton. Oh. From the south side. It's 615 miles you're travelling this time. To the Nouvelle Aquitaine province of France. To the municipal city of Châtelereau. And whose French title is that? <laughs> it is an amazing piece of 1840s surveying. Because we always wondered, why was this not built where it should have been? Where the church was, beside the palace? Mm -hmm. Why did it get plonked in this seemingly random spot in the park? Nothing random about this spot in the park. Now, <coughs> you've got to give it a wee bit of leeway. Back in the 1840s, they didn't have Google Maps, they didn't have GPS, they didn't have satellites. The line from Brodick to Holyrood actually crosses about a mile north of us, but the, the top end is Strathclyde Loch. But when you consider what they had to survey back then, the fact they're only about two degrees out, mm -hmm. oh, we're claiming that, it's a remarkable piece, how close they've actually got it, with the technology they would have had at the time. And I say this would have been the front door. So, if she's like to make your way down into the courtyard, folks, I've got to see the front of the building. With the three gates and the five carvings. Now the carvings you see out here, you'll also see carvings inside the chapel. These were all the work of one man, a Musselborough sculptor by the name of Alexander Handyside Ritchie. We're not quite sure how much was paid for his work, but so the story goes. So impressed was the Duke of his work, therefore so well paid he was, he was seemingly never in need of work again. But we think you're looking at about seven years worth of work doing the carvings down here. The lions are keeping a constant guard, constant vigil on the building. 
Hence, one awake and one sleeping. If the legend has it one day and that lady to Otolo over there is going to finally wake up, let him get some sleep. If you would like to formally introduce yourselves, that's Mozzie and that's Liam up there. Uh, the wee bit just to impress you with the lions, each of them are carved out of a single block of stone. Take a team of 15 players their horses to pull each block into place. And then hand his head Richie starts and gets off to work. The faces, our rogues gallery from left to right. We have life, we have death, and we have immortality. The life of the full garner flowers in his hair, the worry lines in his forehead. You can still make out the clock face that's under his chin with the hour hand pointing up to 12. That's a clock set at 12 noon for man in the prime of his life. <coughs> Death, on the other hand, is a sleep that never wakes. That's why he's got his finger over his mouth asking for silence. Uh, we do get a few people asking, why has he got tomatoes in his hair? <laughs> they are, of course, poppies, the death flower we've got in his hair. And then if he's come in, have a closer look at all the mortality. His forehead, biting its own tail. That's an old Egyptian symbol for eternal life cycle and the reincarnation. There's also, in among the flowers in his hair, you can still see the body of the butterfly. Just a few years ago, somebody came down and popped the wings off it. We can't blame teen the part for that one, um, sort of thing. But that would have been the Greek symbol for immortality, for eternal life. So you can see all these elements from his classical studies that he loved. He's bringing into his building. He's, he's Greek, he's Roman, he's biblical. A lot of Egyptian, as you'll find out as we go along. So I say this at the front door. If we were here on official business, if a Hamilton has been laid to rest within these walls, then we as the guests, as the mourners, would have entered in through the life gate, and made our way inside into the crypt. The casket would have been carried in through the death gate. When all was said and done, we would have been, I'll just repeat that, would have been coming out of the immortality gate. As I say, it's the only one in the middle, it's the only one that gets open these days, so don't worry, we're not tempting fate. Right. Have we got any cat owners in the house today? Yep. Ah. Right. When cats are relaxed and they're sleeping, are their claws in or are their claws out? In, sure. Of course they are. Of course their claws are attracted. Of course they are. Unless it was the mad cats I used to have my hoose sort of thing or that. But no, yes, the claws are attracted into their paws. Oh dear. Claws are out. Such was the shame and embarrassment felt by hand aside Richie making such a basic error. He promptly went away and committed suicide. <laughs> load of rubbish. Great wee story, load of rubbish. First mention of these gentlemen won't be the last. Watch what you read on Masonic sources. For the gentlemen of the lodge do like to spear off on strange tangents. Sorry, I'm as if a lark call. I can get away with that. The boys know me. I've not had the thunderbolt hit me yet. Sort of thing. Um, no, handy said Richie carried on working for about another ten years before he passed away. But when he died, his estate was worth for me uh, six pounds, ten shillings and sixpence. So he must have had a grand time with the Duke's money. You can't take it with you, as they say. Have a look at the faces again. More to the point, have a look at the wear rate on them. I mean, look how well worn life is. I mean, he's in the nose job, among other things. Death, not too bad. All the mortality is still in excellent condition for a 160-year-old carving. Now, whether that's accident, design, or there's other forces at work down here, the official answer we get is prevailing wind direction. And usually when I mention this, the wind starts picking up, and you can feel it burling in a clockwise direction in the courtyard. So that's why they say that side of the building is wearing down quicker than that side. And we go, aye, sure it is. So we'll await a better theory than that one. And then the classic one is the Duke's down here, he's entourage, and he breaks off and he goes, you know what, lads? What, your grace? I have an OP feeling we're going to meet that man very soon. Off away, your grace, your havering. I know, lads, I'll see you uh, tomorrow. Right, your grace. And he promptly dies that night. 
No. That's another one of the great Masonic tales. Not unless our boy knew how to get from here to London in just a couple of hours back in 1852. <laughs> then again, when you start researching him and his interests and everything, um, time travel, you wouldn't put it past him. Uh, those of you who have been regulars to the museum know we used to have a jet engine at the front door. And there was an April Fool's and we did it without the rest of the staff knowing about it. Uh, we actually made up new panels and we had that actually was the Grand Turbination Device. Drink Alexander knew exactly what it was. The Grand Turbination Device from the UFO that crashed in the low parks in the 1830s. <laughs> and that is why the mausoleum is shaped as it is because it's based on the UFO design. We went to great means getting all our panels all made up. And, aye, people just started reading it and going, oh aye, and just walked on along from it. So it's the same. Between that and sticking a skeleton in the statue outside as well, the big sculpture. Right, let's see if I find my key. It's time to go in front. And this is our craft. At its high point, you would have found up to 17 members of the family residing down in here. So all the ancestors brought across from the Collegiate Church and then added to over the years. And I say the memorials, 11 and 12, they were the last in, and they were the first out. Uh, in October of uh, 1921, the decision was made to remove the bodies. In the spring of 1921, that's when the two Romans were removed. They were taken over to Arm, and that's when we were taken today over to the castle. And in October 1921, everybody else down here, plus his nibs up the stairs were removed, taken up to the bench cemetery in the town, where you'll find them in the brand new plot up there. And then it was about 15 years before this part of the building was being saved up to allow members of the public back in. That's why, what we can admire the Vine Council of Workmanship and the ceiling. <laughs> they meant well at the time, but if, like me, you live in a sandstone building, you know. Sandstone breathes, it contracts its bands through the year. Cement and concrete does not. So in the long, long, long term, this will have to be something that will need to be rectified. But when you consider how much movement the building went through, the fact that this only part of the ceiling here was only their job to do, but again, it's a testament to the strength of the building. That dome you can see in the ceiling, you won't feel on the floor above from the walk there. The centre pillar, which is holding all this up, when you stand in the centre circle upstairs, you stand on top of this pillar. These are the original candle holders. In fact, the candle holders, the big doors, and the lattice part of the gates are all the originals. From the car and the handworks up in Falkirk. But as far as we're aware, it has never been breathed in here. Very little air or water pollution gets in. Even the door now, jammed semi-open. Very little air or water pollution gets in here. Wind needs to be shut over. In the corner of each, or the corner of the I'll come in here and then put my top top to the air. There is a ventilation chart. There's one in each corner of the hole. And the chart runs all the way up. Basically, to the top of the building, right up to the top of the cupola, up to the top of the dome. Which would mean that this place would not get damp, would not get musty, it would be aired, it would be ventilated, it would be dry. Because the old coffins just sat in these niches. They weren't sealed in, they just sat in these niches. The only problem is, when the bodies were removed, nobody actually thought that they'd go. So your guess is as good as anybody's. So you can pick your own spot, no you can contradict it. Or you can ask the staff through a letter club who were over here one day. Uh, they've never seen anything in their archive. The best we can come up with is that the first trip was in one of these corner alcoves, and the fourth trip was in one of these corner alcoves. That's as best as anybody has got. The duke who was missing in action was the second duke. Now, before the duke that was created, he would have been Lord, Ham Lord Hamilton, Earl of Arran, Prince Eugene of Scotland. It was King Charles 
first who created the dukedom. And then not long after that, that annoying chap, Oliver Cromwell, comes along and kicks off the English Civil War. So there's pressure put on the first duke to lead the Royal Army from Scotland and support his king. He just made you duke, sir, so come on, you come down. So he did, was wounded at the Battle of Preston, uh, Preston was captured, tried for treason by Oliver Cromwell, found guilty, and then went home to Scotland. <coughs> all being the duke. So his brother takes over the second duke. He again leads the Royalist army down to England. He is wounded at the Battle of Worcester and dies from the lead poisoning from the musket ball in his mind. He's the one who's still buried down in England, down in Worcester. Then, of course, Cromwell comes up to Scotland for the Scottish campaign. He actually had his officers billeted in the palace. But the palace is far too grand, even its original incarnation, far too grand for a Puritan like Cromwell to stay in. So he actually stayed in a wee farmhouse in what is now Woodland Gardens, just along from Woodside Road, just along from the primary school. So the wee private scheme that's in there, all of Cromwell stayed in there. Don't know what happened, but the profit rates in there, but yes, that's where Cromwell stayed. So, it's good to see what we atmosphere in here. A lot of people like just coming in here. Um, we used to do the Halloween tours. <laughs> which meant that yes, we had a whole candle lit in here. And if you think it's quite atmospheric as it is just now, oh, see the candles are all lit in here. It is fabulous. We've had some good fun with people. We've had the spiritualists in here. They're good fun. Oh my god. <laughs> you see the whole just walk away, but see my own such It's up right now. And of course, we've had the various filming taking place in here. So, uh, last Friday, Nishi's over there, and Nishi's in there, and all that. When they've been actually at their post, uh, plates with them in place, and they could because if there actually was, Drew buried in there for the Apple TV series, Buccaneers. So, that's the second time that we've filmed here this summer. Makes up for uh, Guillermo del Toro's numbers, because he was supposed to be coming here to film his Frankenstein project here. Uh, yes, upstairs was going to be a coffee painting room, uh, which tied that trouble with a story. But if he was here last August, I was talking about him, he's a lovely, lovely guy. I was telling some of the stories as you'll get upstairs, and I wondered if that had But no, he decided that wanted to go to Albany, which he was going to film instead. So, but uh, Nicky Chapman from Escape to the Country has been running around this place like a man to schoolgirl as well. And I did try and send her off stuff to BBC Wales to try and tempt Dr. Who here. Come on, Dalek Tempo. Come on. <laughs> uh, but no, it was not. And the girl from BBC, the uh, rock film, and the reproduction girl said, and a very parochial down in Cardiff. We don't like straying too far away from there or something like that. So that's how probably why you never go. So it's between that or one Iron Maiden playing the tribune up there. Still want to see Bruce Dickinson hanging off one of the lines up there. Sort of thing. <laughs> but that indeed is the, is the crypt, folks. This is the appetizer. The main event is, of course, upstairs. Now, there are no internal stairs from the mausoleum, but means we need to go to the scenic group out the front door, around, and we're sneaking in the back door. So I'll see you up there. Take your time going round with these stairs. And now's our chance to look at the picture. He's want to come round this side, folks. And we'll get you all together. Because if you spread out, I will need to go back and forth, back and forth. My head will go around the Linda Blue and the Exorcist, and you will not hear a single word I say. So, this is our chapel. This is the working part of the building. This is Duke Alexander's room. 
This is the room that was fully intended to be the working part of the building for hosting ceremonies and services. But as I'm sure you've now already noticed, we've got a wee bit of an acoustic problem. I am not talking very loudly, but you can hear my voice booming <laughs> around the room. So imagine trying to hold a service in here, two, three, four people trying to talk over. Imagine a couple of people singing. Imagine. Yeah. Imagine a good wee wee minister going to go by our dog room. I must have done that during lockdown. I really did. <laughs> so it became a place of solace, of reflection. One group of gentlemen would continue to use the building. Um, it's also, as far as we can see, one of the first sort of multi-faith, multi-denominational buildings in the area. <laughs> Remember when I said about Duke William getting married off to Princess Maria Baden? Well, when the first few years of their marriage did stay in the palace, before they were seduced by the bright lights of London and then Paris and the lefters, um, the story goes that Duke William would come over here with his, his minister and his entourage, been a Protestant, would come in to the chapel, have his service in peace and quiet, go back over to the palace the following day, Princess Marie, being a Catholic, could come with her priest and her entourage and could come into the mausoleum and have a service in peace and quiet. So it was fully intended to be for everybody's use. However, ah, the echo at the moment is now officially 18 seconds. And you split it into two parts. So the first nine seconds is the nine seconds of sound that you hear. Uh, Ashley Gray from about 10 years ago now. And actually 11 years since the last local show and they were there a couple of weeks later. This is where the Institute of Acoustics set up their equipment, blasted out 120 decibels of sound and then cut it off and you could literally watch the sound wave on their laptop. Wow. Oh, badum, 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 badum. So they could measure it all down for us. So, every sound wave in here is 18 seconds, the echo, but the first nine seconds is, is, the, is the sound. Still know your ears ringing yet, but I'm getting <laughs> them. <laughs> well, between that and the echo is 18 seconds. That is with the wooden doors in place. They are not the original doors. Yes. Uh, if you're ever in Florence, make a stop at the 15th century baptistry. Because there you will see a set of solid gold doors called the Golden Gates of Giberty. These doors are solid gold with five panels per door. They're about, I don't know, 12 feet tall, 14 feet tall, whatever. Duke Alexander saw those doors and went, lads, that's what I want. I want these doors for a mausoleum. Your grace, not even you could afford a set of solid gold doors. <laughs> so to downsize these plans, you just love it with bronze. And instead of five panels, you just have to make do with three. So you got one of the architects installed in the building, dispatched them off to Florence and said, right, I want detailed drawings of the bottom six panels of the Gibbity doors. They came back. And then James Milne comes into the story. James Milne from the family foundry in Edinburgh. As a trial run, had cast a big dot leaf, a big kale leaf in bronze. It was so perfect, the family still have it in their collection. Duke Alexander saw that, he went, right, son, there's the drawings. Let's see what you can do with that. I've seen the film people have been in and taken all my covers off, so I've not got my big reveal anymore. But if you come around this way, yeah, and the original bronze doors. How's that for a door? <laughs> <clears throat> Cast in sections, pinned together, each door weighs three quarters of a ton. Wow. But the doors were so beautifully balanced when they were in place, all you had to do was to shoot your pinky to push them open. And again, if you wanted them closed, you could just shoot your pinky. But do when these things slam shut, 
The wooden doors we have now absorb the sound and the echo. The bronze would have done the opposite. It would have resonated it. But when the bronze doors were in place, this is when the mausoleum had its 30 second echo. And was in so many record books. It's having the longest echo. The doors were taken down for the same reason the bodies were removed from the building. With the building moving and shifting because of the subsidence, mm. there was a fear they're going to be damaged. In fact, that one, it's just, just about where you are there, suddenly you'll actually see it, that it's actually started feeling just about down. About there, there it is. And you actually see where the pressure was actually coming down on the hinge side. So this was just a temporary move, bringing them inside. And then once they realised the mausoleum wasn't coming down, they remained in here ever since. We do get people asking, are there any chance of going to be hung? Come on. This is Hamilton, we're in the last 15 minutes of <laughs> Then again, let's, I'd like to see the team and try and see what it is. Yeah. This is the front of the doors. This is what you would have seen coming up the stairs. The other side is just the panels to hide the impressions and the, the lock maker. How good is your Old Testament? Mm. Good. Right. Joseph and the Court Exchange, in the top man. The Ark of the Covenant. With the power of the Ark, the trumpets are blaring, that indeed is the city of Jericho, and the walls are coming down as the lost tribes are crossing the river there. Just in, back in May, myself and, and Aileen uh, had a school group over here, we P5s, P4, P5s. And one wee boy, I could just see his eyes popping up, because of course on a couple of nights beforehand, he'd just seen Raiders of the Lost Ark for the first time. Oh. <laughs> and he went, Ark of the Covenant? Yes, that Ark of the Covenant. You mean it's real? Yes, it was real. His wee head nearly bounced off the top of the door, and his wee mind was blown. I said, yes, that's another wee boy we've just captured. He'll be here in 20 years' time doing my tours, it's great. Sort of thing. <laughs> and meanwhile, down here is King Solomon in the court of the Queen of Sheba. There is a chap with a lucky hand. Yes. We don't know who had the first rush of blood to the head, to, to the head but somebody came up those stairs, bent down, shook his hand. What are you doing that for? Oh, it's for good luck. And it must have worked. The Victorian lottery numbers must have come up that night. It then became tradition. Anybody walk past the mausoleum, come up the stairs, bend down, shake his hand. When the doors were brought in here and Mrs. Kerr was still doing the tours of the mausoleum, so she still bring people into the chapel, and then became a tradition to shake. So, that's about 150 years worth of the acid off of people's fingertips. Paul's in his hand. So this is your natural bronze. That's your polished bronze. The wee boy in the corner, story goes, a young lady's desperate for a baby boy, she pats him on the head. Uh, my last tour I did before lockdown, it was actually on Saturday before the lockdown was uh, crying, and there was a, a girl on the tour. And she came up to me and said, Aye, Peter, I was in your tour a couple of years ago. All right. And you told me that story. Okay. And I patted him in the head. Uh-huh. Aye, within a year, baby boy. <laughs> so, there we go. If anybody's got a wee compact mirror on them, unfortunately, mine broke. I mean, it all came broke. This is good stuff. This is showing you, therefore, the, the skill of James Milne. Because these, these doors were made out of the lock Try that again. Constructed out of the lost wax process. So basically these panels would have been carved in wax initially. Then sealed in earthen mould. That would have been fired to them. That it gets fired, the wax melts. And then you put your molten bronze then into those moulds so that you break them open. This is why you've got such amazing detail and depth. Um, early lead week in the retired earlier on this year. The year before lockdown she went with the family to a tour of Italy. She went to Florence stood in front of the gibbety doors and went, the doors are there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she sent me some good pictures back. I, I don't know if it's a difference because it was in gold. They couldn't get the detail as well as I've done with this. But, uh, if you had a mirror, <laughs> what to do? Look, I'm not putting any pressure on you. They're okay. There's no there, it's more there. You put the mirror down in front. This chap has been very rude to his bankers. And you shine the torch onto the mirror, and you can actually see his face looking back at you. So, what was it? Oh, we've been doing that. Oh, right. There we go. 
Right. So, two, Okay, and boom, there you go. Oh, right. And you can see, so you can still make out his nose and his cheeks and all that sort of thing. It might have worn away over the years. But there he is. So again, that's just how much detail never can get into these doors. <laughs> but again, that's, that's when your proper master craftsman is at work. Thank you very much for that. And then I say, if you make your way up the slope and down the other side. Instead of the water running down and going out, the water was running down and coming in. So until we got the outside done, we couldn't do anything inside. So long term plan, I've been over here about four times, much lower lately sort of thing. So that will take a long, it will take a good while to get everything all sorted over here. So bear with us the condition of the floor we're getting there. So, same again. Casting sections, pinned together, three quarters of a ton. It is the story of Jacob and Isaac at the top panel, the wrong brother receiving the blessing. There's Charlton Heston. <laughs> yes, get the Ten Commandments at the top of Mount Sinai. And then everybody's favourite is David and Goliath. There's our David, he's felled the great giant. There's his sling and his pebbles used to bring him down. This is the one the kids love. Look at that big boy, he's got a man. And then uh, you, you went away through the bloodshed and the carnage. There they are, taking Goliath's head back in triumph to Jerusalem. <laughs> right. I am going to run over and grab a picture of that. Was, uh, still in here? No. This is the black marble plinth upon which sat the Egyptian sarcophagus. Our boy was laid to rest in. One of two that he had. Uh, basically, if you walked into the main entrance hall of the palace, swept down the black marble staircase, went through the next door, that would have taken you into his grand Egyptian hall, where his two sarcophagi were on display. The green one and the red one. This is the green one. The red one is the one that's on display now in the Kelvin Grove in Glasgow. The Panabas one. This one he acquired due to a wee deal going wrong with the British Museum in 1836. Uh, they were uh, contacting one of their agents uh, who said that uh, Queen Nefertiti's casket is up for sale in Paris. It should be bought on behalf of the nation put on display. Absolutely, the right of the floor shop, second to the museum. And then what went there, man? To Alexander, who just happened to be a trustee of the British Museum. Isn't he in Paris, seen a doctor? Can we get a telegram, a word to him, or that green one? And they got word to him. And he went, oh, absolutely, lads. So he went and saw a sarcophagus. Sent work back to London. It's wonderful, lads. It's wonderful. Buy it, absolutely. 
So if you're wondering in 1836 what well, 632 pounds, eight shillings and sixpence of taxpayers' money could buy you, you could get you one of these. You can imagine no one arrived in London and they open the crate and they go, what's that? What's, no, what's, no, 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 that's the wrong casket, no, that's the wrong one. Yes, we've got transcripts of the letters going back and forth, including the quote of the Duke being humbled, humbugged by those rascally Frenchmen. Either that or the old boy knew exactly what he was up to all along. He held up his hand. Look, lads, I'll take full responsibility for this. This is my expertise. Ancient Egypt. He was one of the foremost Egyptologists of the day. I should have taken more care. Sorry, lads. Sorry, lads. So, £632, 8 shillings and 6 months of Hamilton money. Just happened to find his way to the British Museum. The British Museum could then refund the treasury. Everybody's happy. £10 delivery charge. That's in the palace. Now, the wee soul was in there, long since gone. But he did decide, as befitting the old Magnifico, what about a casket in his mausoleum, in his sarcophagus? And he did try it for size. Maybe he should have tried it even harder. Now, one of his great friends when he's in London is Dr. Thomas Pettigrew. Not only is Dr. Pettigrew, like Duke Alexander, one of the foremost Egyptologists of the day, he's also one of the foremost surgeons of the day. And if you went for your dinner at Dr. Pettigrew's house, You'd have your blood meal in his dining hall when he's there. And then the after dinner entertainment. Right, clear the table. Woof. Bring it on mummy. Do an autopsy. <laughs> Duke Alexander's there front and centre. This is amazing. This is amazing, sir. Yes. You've seen there, Dr. Pettigrew, how, how the Egyptians prepared the bodies. Yes, it is. <sighs> then you could do me. Oh, I think I could. So, yes, when he died, he was done like a proper Egyptian pharaoh. So if you want the full gory details, yes, disemboweled, break through the nose, embalmed, tightly bound. Thing is, there was a wee bit of troubleshooting that had to be done before they could get him in. Because that casket is six feet long. Custom made, depending who you ask, for a woman between five foot two and five foot six. And their voice did six foot two. He was 85, I'd shrunk down a couple of inches, but still against six feet. The stonemasons hollowed out the sarcophagus as much as they could without destroying its integrity. There are a few variations in how they got him in. Story number one. Maybe he was so tightly bound that they could... I mean, that lid literally weighed a ton. So he's not coming back out. Once he's in, he's in. Story number two. Before they actually bind him up, get the hammer. Bang! Bang! Folded legs up. Bind them up that way. He is, in a couple of books, quoted that his famous last words were double me up, double me up. <laughs> Story number three, Gentle of the Lodge will tell you it is chop, chop, put his legs in first, put him over the top of them. Family don't like that story. Number two, but his legs been popped, either his kneecaps popped or his legs broken, fold him up. That's how they got him in. And here he lay for 69 years on his plinth until the decision is made to remove the bodies. So he goes with everybody up to the Bent Cemetery. If you go up to the Bent Cemetery, walk through the main gate, walk past Harry Lauder, singing away, driving us all demented, go to the centre circle, the centre wall but go round, down to the left-hand side, you'll find the Brandon plot. You'll see the big mound that's all nearly curved and edged, and then you'll see the big stone monolith that's got the names front and rear telling you who's buried up there. Under the big monolith, it's a concrete burial chamber into which was placed Duke Alexander, still in his sarcophagus. And he's under that. Uh, when Strathclyde Park opened in 1975, there was a call to actually dig him back up and bring him back down to his mausoleum. It's a tourist attraction. <laughs> no, he's still up there. But if you have a look on top of the plinth, you can still make out the outline and the length by the base of the sarcophagus. I'm not going to ask anybody to volunteer to try it for size, but you can actually see just how small even just the base of that sarcophagus, how much would it hold out, but how much room. But as I say, go away black, it's favourite material. He's got his full name, Alexander of Hamilton, Brandon and Chaffarot. So, that's his Scottish title. That, of course, is his French title. 
When he became Duke in 1819, he's actually holiday in France with the family. So what's the first thing he does? He does as soon as he becomes Duke. Does he rush home to get the, the, his dad's funeral plan? No! He turns up at the French Parliament demanding to take his seat and gets told to, away, oh, we want you, and all that sort of thing. Brandon, of course, is his English title. At the Act of Union between Scotland and England, the first thing they do there at the House of Lords, they ban all the Scottish Dukes and Lords from taking their place in the House of Lords. So what do our boys do? They send on England and Wales looking for dead titles they can buy up. Duke of Hamilton got the Brandon title, got back into the House of Lords. So you thought you could keep me out, didn't you, boys? So that's where the three titles come from, Hamilton, Brandon and Chateau. So again, that's where the Brandon name comes from, around Hamilton. As I've said again, Galway Black, his favourite material. You would have seen it in the palace, including the legendary staircase, the marble staircase, which I could tell you where it is and then need to put you down the Clyde. Um, but it is close. You can see it in the floor. We've got the Galway Black, we've got the Porphyry, we've got the Jasper, we've got the Peterhead granite, quarried by the prisoners of a Peterhead prison, stone from Egypt, from Rome, from the Balkans, from Greece, all points in between. There is anywhere between 42 and 48 different types of stone and marble in this floor. See, it's getting to be on the dark side. The layout of this floor. Remember that pillar downstairs? That's me standing on top of it. Centre of the sun, centre of the universe, with the compass points radiating around it. The black light here radiating around us is representing the pages of the Bible spread out before us. The outer ring between the diamond and the mountains. So doing a ceremony. I hope to break up the time for the the of the arrow. Something very long to go and take the out. So it's why the building facing the east, it's why the building has three gates, quite a lot of trees in the building, placing from the floor to the first ring, from the first ring to the second ring, from the second ring to the top of the dome, it's about the three feet from the dumps. If you go on to any of the side of sites, and they're talking about the mausoleum. You will get an amazing bit of detail. Uh, they'll tell you as much as they're going to tell you about how the world works without getting them away. But do watch, you will get some mad stories as well when you're going to take away a pinch of salt. Right, as usual, I'm running late, but we're just about done. Handy side Richie, one seat's filling out his carvings outside, comes inside. That's the Hamilton family coat of arms above the casket. Beckford family coat of arms above the door. Each one is an individual. Not only that, no matter where you stand in this room, one of these three guys is going to die one This is not going to be See, you've got an angel to talk to who, whoever boys up here or something. Uh, space honours and they all hope to God. 
love to praise God, glory in the highest. Nothing without God. God is my protector, my refuge, my solace. a shadow in this building. Your shadow's all the direct line of the feet, no matter where you go. But I think my voice is just about held up long enough. That indeed, folks, is the mausoleum. So, one singer, one song, who'd like to volunteer to try the echo. Classical music composer, so his mausoleum suite was recorded in here. They did a live rendition of it in here, and I won very cold February night. It was great. The Chrono String Quartet played in here as well. Uh, Peter Govins, our tame throat singer, who gives it the old new, new, if he's had more there. And he's a howdy with that. We've had everything from a brass ensemble playing in here to people bringing their guitars in here, 
So this is now the tomb of El Magnifico, the tomb of the Duke of Hamilton. He's in here in his sarcophagus and he's vertical, but in there. This is Bent Cemetery in Hamilton, it's right up the back if anybody's trying to find it. So this is uh, the wee cottage that Peter spoke about during the tour. It's got an unusually large chimney for a wee cottage. Reason being that all the smoke from the fire that heats the mausoleum comes underground and goes out that chimney too. Is that no ingenious, eh, Peter? That's right, that's right. 